subscribe, like, leave a comment, you won't find such information anywhere else. Great chess players, brilliant scientists, outstanding artists, who refused to return to the U.S. or from foreign business trips. On June 30, 1974, Soviet dancer Mikhail Brishnikov accepted the offer of the famous ballet critic Clive Barnes and decided not to return from a foreign tour to the U.S. Or. Immediately after the last performance in Toronto, he asked to say goodbye to friends who were waiting for him on the street and, getting into their car, drove away. The term non-returnee, which existed only in the U.S. Or, means a person who refused to return from a foreign trip and stayed to live in one of the Western countries. The Soviet government faced the problem of non-returnees at the beginning of its existence. Life has remembered the most outstanding people who, for one reason or another, became non-returnees. Immediately after the October Revolution, the Soviet government made it much more difficult for citizens to travel abroad. Formally, until the mid-twenties, it was open, but for this it was necessary to obtain a passport, and in order to be issued, it was necessary to take a certificate from the GPU that it did not object to departure. In addition, a reason was needed. In most cases, it was a reunion with relatives. Most often, this could be used by representatives of national minorities, in particular Russian, Germans, who were allowed to leave the country almost unhindered. In addition, for some time in the criminal code there was such a measure as expulsion abroad as a punishment. However, in the conditions of total devastation after war communism and the civil war, this punishment rather resembled a reward, so it was almost never applied. One can only recall the philosophical steamer on which a group of scientists disloyal to the new government was sent. In the late twenties, with the collapse of the NEP, the exit from the country was actually closed. Permission to travel abroad, not related to a business trip, is issued only in exceptional cases. In the 1935, the death penalty was introduced for fleeing abroad, since an attempt to escape from the country was equated with high treason. The law also provided for the confiscation of all the fugitive's property and exile to Siberia for five years for all his relatives. With this measure, the authorities hoped to frighten Soviet employees, who often refused to return from abroad, where they were at work. Moreover, there were many party members among the fugitives, including those with pre-revolutionary experience. Despite the measures taken, the flow of non-returnees did not dry up. A great chess player who became one of the first Soviet non-returnees. Alekhine came from a noble family. His father was a deputy of the last imperial state Duma. Alekhine has been fond of chess since childhood. When he was 10 years old, the famous American chess player Harry Pillsbury came to St. Petersburg, who held a session of simultaneous play on several boards. Ten-year-old Alec Hine then painted with him. By the age of 18, Alec Hine had already taken high places at major international tournaments. At the St. Petersburg International Masters Tournament of the 1914th year, which brought together all the best chess players in the world, Alec Hine took third place second only to chess legends Lasker and Capablanca. Alec Hine was unfit for combat service for health reasons, but in 1916 he went to the front as part of a Red Cross detachment that provided assistance to the wounded. Aliokin had to carry the wounded from the battlefield, he was twice concussed and had awards. After the revolution, the chess player was left without money and without the opportunity to play and the punishing sword of the proletariat hung over his head. Aliokin almost died in Odessa after its capture by the Bolsheviks. As a bourgeois and nobleman, he was arrested, set in the basement of the Chaka, and they were going to shoot him. But someone from high-ranking Bolsheviks found out about the misadventures of the chess player. Manulsky, Rukovsky or Trotsky are mentioned in various sources, and the case was closed. The chess was destroyed. The player was released. Aliokin finally decided to leave. This was made possible by marrying a Swiss citizen. After that, Aliokin was given permission to leave. However, the permission did not say about leaving forever. Alekhine asked for permission to go to visit his wife's relatives, as well as to participate in chess tournaments in Europe. And at first Alekhine was considered a Soviet chess player in the USR. 
Soviet newspapers reported on his victories. In 1927, Alekhine became a world celebrity, defeating the indestructible Cuban Capablanca in a match for the world title. Moreover, the letter surrendered in advance, not showing up for the last batch. The Russian emigration honored Alekhine, and materials appeared in the press about the ideological closeness of the chess king with the anti-Soviet emigration. After that, in the USR, he was considered a convinced counter-revolutionary. The head of the USR chess organization Nikolai Krylenko, part-time deputy people's commissar of justice of the RSF sir, made a statement in which he called on Elekhine to be considered as an enemy of the state of workers and peasants. In the mid-30s, Elekhine lost the championship match to Ava, but soon took revenge and became world champion again. However, his further career was interrupted by the outbreak of war. One can only guess what heights a chess player could have reached if two world wars and one civil war had not occurred in his best years. To this day, Alec Hine remains one of the two undefeated world champions. The second, Fischer, was stripped of his title due to the refusal of a rematch, since he died in the 46th year before he had time to fight the new contender for the chess crown. According to the calculations of the Portal Chess Base, Tom Alekhine is the absolute leader in the percentage of total registered wins among all world champions. When Soviet officials in 1926 gave permission for an unknown 20-year-old girl to leave, they could hardly imagine that she would become one of the most important authors in 20th century American literature and a cult figure in the United States and a number of other countries. Alice Rosenbaum's father shortly before the revolution became the owner of a pharmacy in Petrograd, but in the 1918th century it was nationalized, which, of course, had a great influence on the future views of the writer. She enrolled in film school, hoping to find a loophole later and moved to the United States to work there in the film industry. A loophole was soon found, one of the few legal ways to leave the country was to go to study. However, Students were released only if they were sent by the highest decree from above or if they had relatives there who could support them. Fortunately for Alice, she had an aunt in the USA who emigrated before the revolution, and she agreed to shelter her niece. The girl applied for permission to go to America for a few months to study, and then shoot films in the USA that denounced the class enemy and contributed to the new conquests of the proletariat. Permission was obtained, and the girl left not planning to return and leaving all her relatives in the USR. Alice's relatives did not believe until the last minute that she would be released. In the USA, she changed her name to Ayn Rand, but did not achieve much success in Hollywood. An attempt to write a novel about the horrors of the totalitarian system on the example of the USR, We Are Alive, also did not bring success. And only the subsequent The Source and Atlas Shrugged turned her into one of the main writers of the century. These books, a passionate hymn to freedom, individuality, and reasonable egoism, became a reflection of the philosophy created by Rand, called objectivism. This philosophy has had a huge impact on the libertarian movement, although Rand herself has always distanced herself from it. Rand's books are still published worldwide in millions of copies. According to opinion polls, about one in ten American adults has read her main novel, Atlas Shrugged. Almost all of Rand's relatives who remained in the U.S. or died, her father and mother died in the besieged Leningrad, and her lover was shot in 1937. Only one of her sisters survived, who later moved with her to America, but then returned to the U.S. Or. The son of Avyaka Peasant became famous for his mighty voice back in pre-revolutionary times and became an opera star not only of the Russian, but also of the world scale, performing at the most famous venues in the world. After the revolution, Chalyapin, who had previously sympathized with the socialists, was appointed artistic director of the Marinsky Theater, and was also one of the first to be awarded the title of People's Artist. However, accustomed to luxury and universal respect, Chalyapin could not put up with a half-starved existence and constant searches conducted by revolutionary soldiers, sailors, or security officers. In 1921, with the help of Lonacharsky, he obtained permission for himself to tour abroad, on condition that he would give half of his foreign exchange fees to the state. After the first round, 
he returned, so no one suspected him of intending to leave the country. Shalyapin even managed to get permission to go on a tour with his family. He never returned to Russia, however, partly through no fault of his own. After one of the concerts, he donated part of the fee to the children of Russian emigrants. This became known in the Kremlin, and Chelyapin was declared a counter-revolutionary who financed white guard organizations and deprived of the title of people's artist. After that, it was not only pointless to return, but also dangerous. In exile, Chelyapin toured around the world and starred in films until his death. However, the heyday of his work is considered to be the pre-revolutionary period. He comes from a noble family and is one of the most prominent chemists of the Russian Empire. During the First World War, he created the chemical industry in the country almost from scratch in the shortest possible time. Lieutenant General of the Imperial Army After the Revolution most of the general's relatives emigrated from the country, including his brother Nikolai, in whose house the last Russian emperor and his family were shot in Yekaterinburg. But Vladimir, at Lenin's insistence, was engaged in the development of the now Soviet chemical industry. Ipetiv decided to flee the country after the discovery of a conspiracy of pasts in the chemical industry, as a result of which several prominent specialists were shot. Upon learning about this, Ipetiv who was on a business trip abroad, refused to return to the USA. The scientist moved to the USA, where he became a teacher of organic chemistry. At first, Epitiv did not want to break ties with the country and even regularly sent the results of his research to Soviet laboratories. However, he was persistently demanded to return as soon as possible. When it became clear that Epitiv did not want to return, he was expelled from the Academy of Sciences and deprived of Soviet citizenship. His son, who remained in the USA, was arrested. In the USA, Epitiv made a significant contribution to the development of catalytic cracking technology, which makes it possible to obtain a much larger amount of gasoline from oil in the refining process. His work also contributed to the emergence of high-octane gasoline, which began to be used in aviation. In the USA, the production of high-octane gasoline could not be established on a significant scale and it came from the USA as part of land lease supplies. Until the end of his life, Epitiv was acutely worried about the fact that he had to leave his country. The daughter of the all-powerful leader of the peoples, Conrad Stalin, unexpectedly preferred the hostile capitalist environment to the Soviet labor collective. In 1966, she went to India to see off her common-law husband, after which she decided not to return to the USA and asked for political asylum in the United States, leaving her son and daughter in the USA. Of course, the Americans could not fail to take advantage of such an amazing opportunity to tease a rival in the propaganda field and granted her asylum, and soon after published her book 20 Letters to a Friend. She got a good fee for this book. In the USA, she became Lena Peters and got married, although she soon divorced. For several years she traveled all over the world, but then the money began to run out. In 1984, she suddenly returned to the USA with her daughter, who was already born in the USA. Now the Soviet side could not but take advantage of the situation and turn it to its advantage. She was immediately restored her citizenship, provided with a three-room apartment, a car with a driver, and a monthly allowance. However, after living for a year and a half, she again demanded to be released abroad, after which she renounced Soviet citizenship and left for the United States, never to return. In the 60s and especially in the 70s, most of the non-returnees became athletes and artists. If in the 20s and 40s the defectors were mainly intelligence officers and diplomatic workers, who were then hunted by the NKD, or scientists who feared for their lives, then after Stalin's death, mostly Soviet celebrities began to remain in the West. They already had not only all union, but often worldwide fame, and they were regularly offered to stay on tour, which would significantly increase their material wealth, since they had to give a significant part of their foreign exchange fees to the state. The first swallow was the outstanding dancer Rudolf Nureyev. 
At that time, Soviet citizens on foreign trips were always accompanied by KGB agents who monitored their behavior. Nureyev, who too often and freely communicated with foreigners, caused their discontent, and they decided to suspend him from touring in London, but he refused to return. He was still convicted in absentia for treason for seven years. In the future, non-returnees, if they were not high-ranking people from the KGB system, were simply deprived of citizenship. In 1974, Mikhail Brezhnikov stayed in Canada. In the 79th year, his example was followed by his classmate at the choreographic school, Alexander Godunov, figure skaters Protopopov and Belusova, hockey players Majolny and Fedorov. Director Tarkovsky also did not return. Their fates turned out differently. Nureyev continued to be one of the best dancers in the world and headed the Paris Opera Ballet Company. Brezhnikov became the main star of the American Ballet Theater, starred in films, including the acclaimed film Sex and the City, was nominated for an Oscar for a supporting role, and was engaged in photography. He is one of the few non-returnees who have never visited Russia after the collapse of the USSR. Godunov, who was considered one of the main stars of the Soviet Ballet, was forced to leave the American troupe due to a conflict with Brezhnikov. He decided to focus on film roles, the most famous of which was the role of one of the terrorists in the movie Die Hard. He also starred in a small role in the Oscar-winning film Witness. Hockey players Majolny and Fedorov became NL superstars. Both of them are among the three Russian players who have scored more than a thousand points during their career in the NL. Both were able to win the Stanley Cup and are considered one of the most outstanding hockey players of their time. Fedorov, among other things, became the first European in history to receive an individual heart trophy, which is awarded to the most valuable player of the season. Director Tarkovsky, who was in the status of the main Soviet movie star, while on a business trip to Italy, asked her to extend it for another three years, but Soviet cinematographers rejected his request. Then the director called a press conference and announced his refusal to return to the USSR. But in exile, he managed to make only one film, which received the Grand Prix of the Cannes Film Festival, the second most important award after the Palm Branch, and very soon died of cancer. Many people have left Russia, someone because of the danger of being shot, someone on a national basis, and someone who wanted freedom. I'll tell you all about it in the following videos. Thanks for watching.